for this day. We're gathered in your name. We're calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire to burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're here. Just your voices, sing it right to the heavens. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. All right, hey, good morning, good morning, good morning. You can be seated. Man, it's great to have Cliff singing with us today on an older song. That was great. I haven't sung that song in ever. And then you guys know that Cliff is like a rock star guy. He's like the lead vocalist for Maiden Kane. They open up for like Iron Maiden and all these guys. And when he lets his hair down, it flows in the wind and everything. It's really cool. Anyway, hey, welcome, welcome. If you're a guest today, my name is Mitch Todd. I'm the pastor here, and I just want to welcome you. If you're, if you're a guest and, and maybe you haven't had a chance to fill out a card, let us know that you're here. We'd love for you to fill this out and love to send you information about the church and, and let you know the things that are going on. There's a lot of things happening. We send a couple emails out a week just about a lot of the things. We try to keep our announcement time kind of shorter on the front end up here so we can kind of focus on worship, but we'd love to have you. If you, uh, you know, we're a high-tech church here, so if you want to scan this QR code, you can uh, fill that out digitally and I'll send it right straight to us but hey we're glad that you're here we're glad that you're worshiping with us and today's an exciting day i'm really excited about it i was worried about the weather but i think it's going to be good and we're going to have baptisms at the beach today and it's going to be at one o'clock and i'm gonna you know we'll wrap up from here and um and, I, and go and we'll meet at maxine barrett park if you don't know where that's at um most of you probably know where sharkies is at it's just south of sharkies on the right and uh, you can go in when you pull into the park if you can park to the right, that'd be great, but go to the right. There's a big pavilion up there, and uh, we got some folks that are setting up there now. Hopefully, we've got the pavilion, 
And uh, we're going to meet there, and then we'll walk on down to the beach, and we'll do some baptism stuff. I think it's going to be a great day, and I know you'll be encouraged. What I would just encourage you to do is, like, like this, even if you're not getting baptized, you know, one of the beauties of the local church is to come together and support uh, those who are making that decision for Christ. And so I'd love to have you come out, and then we'll hang out, and, you know, maybe we can go, to, you can buy my lunch at Sharky's afterwards or something. <laughs> so... Hey, but we're glad you're here. Hey, and if and also, you know, if you uh, have you been thinking about joining the church or kind of rowing the boat with us, we kind of always talk like that. Hey, we're kind of trying to do our best to make a difference in the community and really let our light shine in the community. We'd love for you to consider uh, placing your membership here at the church. I'll be back in the next steps area after the after this service, and I'd love to talk to you. This is our last uh, this is our last new members luncheon that we had just a few weeks ago. We had like 17 new uh, members uh, at the church, it's, and that was just awesome, yeah, it was really good. So what we're doing is, is that uh, we're going to be having those regularly. This is a really large one because we hadn't done it before, but we're going to be having these regularly, and we'll announce them a few weeks in advance uh, when we've had enough people, you know, kind of put their membership in, and so that's kind of one of the ways that we're doing, just to kind of get to know our new folks a little bit a little bit better, and so hope that you'll join us for that. Hey, would you stand with us right now, and let's, uh, let's pray. We're continuing on the series today, and we're, we're talking about being grateful before the Lord, and it's a part of this series on Stay Positive, and it's a, a deeply biblical problem that we need to talk about as a culture, and really, really understanding the blessings that we have that God has given to us. So let's pray. Father, we lift up our time to you today, and as we talk about gratefulness, uh, would you forgive me for the times that I haven't been grateful? And would you remind us, help all of us, God, to be reminded of the great blessings that we have and what you've given to us. So, Father, we lift up this time to you and we pray that the heavens would open up right now and that we would, in our worship, see a glimpse of you. That somehow right now even through our worship that as the heavens open up that heaven and earth would kiss and that you would reveal yourself to us this morning we pray this in jesus name amen
to see my sin upon that cross. Good. good morning, good morning, church family. It's great to have you here. My name is Robert, and I am one of the elders here at church, and I am humbled and thankful to be able to lead us in communion this morning. As Mitch mentioned earlier, we're on this Be Positive uh, series that he has, and today we're, we're concentrating on gratefulness and how we should be thankful and grateful. And I thought about this week. You know, a week ago we celebrated the 4th of July and how much we have to be thankful for our freedom and our chance to be here and worship freely and uh, how important it is for us to stay positive. And I was thinking about that all week, how I need to be thankful. I need to be gratitude grateful. And that gives me a positive attitude. Um, at our house, Julie and I, we start the, the day in a, a little worship in, in the morning. And uh, the other thing, we, uh, Alexis wakes us up in the morning with uh, It's a Wonderful Wool World by Louis Armstrong. And it's just a positive way to start the day and to be thankful. We are, as Christians are called not to be Debbie Downers, but to be positive, to be uplifted. And to do that, we need to be thankful. And that's what this message is about. And Mitch uh, has a great message for us today. But uh, I'm thankful that we get to do communion every week. To me, it is an important part of, of my worship time that we can come as a family, come as a church, break bread together, and remember and be thankful. So will you just take a few moments as we prepare our hearts and minds? Those that are at home, I ask that you get uh, a cracker or some juice and to join us in this time. So let's prepare our hearts and minds. Our communion verse is taken from Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29. They were in an upper room, Jesus was, with his friends. And while they were eating, he took bread. He gave thanks, and he broke it. And he said to his friends, his family, his disciples, he said, take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup. He gave thanks. And he said to them, drink it, all of you. This is my blood. He said, I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it anew in my Father's kingdom. grateful. We have been blessed. We live in a country that we're very blessed. As one of the elders, I want to thank you for your generosity in your monies, your gifts, your talents. I want to tell you that we as elders do not take our job lightly, but when you entrust us with your gifts, we want to bring glory and honor to our Heavenly Father and to do it in the best way. There's a way of, of giving on our card. You can uh, scan that. I know a lot of us don't carry dollars with us, but we can scan that, give, give electronically. We also have receptacles in the back. But I want to say thank you. We promise that we will do the best with the monies that you share with us. Will you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this day. We thank you and are grateful for all the blessings that we have, the big ones and the small ones. Father, we know that there's trials and tribulations in life, but you call us to look at the bright side, to be grateful. If we do that at the start of our day, we can be nothing but joyful. 
Father, we know that the, the enemy and those look upon us and wonder what's going on. Why do they have a joy, joyful heart? Father, help us to continue to be grateful and to realize it's because of you that we have joy in our hearts. So, Father, we, uh, again, thank you that we can come as a church and break bread together. Will you please join with me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
All right. Oh, man. It is good. Good to be here. I mean, like, it's good to be here. <laughs> take a breath. Just take a big breath. We're alive. We're here. I mean, like, sometimes I think we just don't think about that. This is a miracle that we woke up this morning and we're, we're actually alive. And it's, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that right there, that I'm alive. I mean, you think about this. When you think about the universe, you, especially if you, if you go out at night and you look up in the stars, if it's a clear night and you're able to see out into the universe, and you just kind of go, this is amazing. God, I, I can't believe we're actually here. It's good to be alive and to to be thankful for that and to take a breath. And when I think about the vastness of the universe, the fact that you and I are here right now and that we're, we're able to talk to each other and we're able to see each other and we're able to smell each other, you know? I mean, it's miraculous. And I think, I think we just don't think about that. I think it's we don't think about that enough. We get so wrapped up in our lives and we get so wrapped up in what we're doing and our, our jobs or, or, you know, all the, our tasks that I'm just trying to, I want to get to this point where the first thing that I do when I wake up in the morning, I'm just going, I'm alive. I'm, I'm here. God, thank you for this. This is the greatest gift. I mean, you've given us the gift of life, not even just here on this planet, but you've given us the gift of life eternally too. And I think coming to that point of gratitude will be one of the healthiest things that we can do as believers. I mean, it's one of the reasons that I wanted to do this series is, is because when I look at the negativity around the world and just this fast-pacedness of the world and the things that we do, and we just get wrapped up in all these things. And, and when we're not grateful for what we have, it actually frustrates God. It actually disappoints God. And we see throughout Scripture where uh, God gets frustrated with a thankless people. And ungrateful people. It displeasures God when there's grumbling, especially among his people. And when there's a constant negativity. And we see this all throughout scripture that negativity has destroyed God's people. More than any other negative value is negativity. And it's just all around us. If we're not careful, it's just all around us. And it's so easy for us. And we talked about that last week that you know, it's so easy for us because negativity breeds negativity. And so we can be around negative people and it just drags us down. It causes us to be negative or we're worst case scenario thinkers like we talked about last week. But one of the keys and one of the secret keys is this topic that we're talking about in gratitude. How many of you guys play video games? How many of you classify yourself as a gamer? You're vid you play video games? Really? <laughs> Come on now. I know we're a little bit older. We're going to add... Sudoku and solitaire on iPads and phones. Now raise your hands. All right, all right. That's, that's a little more like it. I knew, I knew we had more gamers than that, all right? So, like, I, I'm a gamer, too. I've got this, but I'm, I'm a, I am a gamer for you, for you young people over here. I, I know I'm, like, I used to be called Mario Mitch, actually, a long time ago. <laughs> that's no joke. When I had my MacGyver hairstyle. I was also called Mitch MacGyver. But anyway. Uh, I got sidetracked on that, but like I'm not talking about just like PS4 games. PS4. I'm a gamer with. I have this one game where I'm learning new words. You know, constantly learning. I'm from Kentucky, so I have to work on my vocabulary. If you're around me long enough, you'll hear some Mitchisms, and uh, I'll go home from time to time, and I'll say to Michelle, I'll "Say, hey, what did you think about the message today? What can I do to improve?" Da, 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 da. And she'll say, "Well, you butchered this word. This word does not mean what you thought that it meant." You know. And so uh, if I ever use a word that's offensive to you, it's pr nine times out of ten, it's going to mean that I did not know what that word meant. <laughs> so I play this one game to help me with my vocabulary, you know. And, and, but I've noticed this, and if you're a gamer, you know this. You've got to beat this level before you can get to the next level. So you beat this level, and it unlocks other levels. Well, today, what we're talking about is this attitude of having an attitude of gratitude in our life 
is like this secret key. I mean, it literally is like the secret key to unlock all these other levels in our life that will lead us to have a life that is a positive life. And if we can get this one gratitude value down, it actually unlocks all these other values like optimism, like we talked about uh, optimism. And this is, and I, and I don't know why I feel like I have to give this disclaimer, but for those of you who are like deep theologians, and you may look at a message series like, stay positive. Oh, this is like a puff and fluff message. Like, you know, we need some meat. Well, here's the thing, though. This is not that I'm becoming optimal. I'm not becoming optimistic but based on how I feel, because our feelings can betray us. Our feelings can mislead us. I'm being optimistic about this world that we live in and the blessings that we have in our life, because this is what God says. The song that Michelle led this morning, you say I am, this is what you say that I am. I'm going to believe in this. And so the, the world lies to us and tells us this over here, but I'm going to be optimistic because God says this about me. And, and when, you're, when you understand that blessing of God and we get the attitude of gratitude right, then we actually get the optimistic part right. When we, get the, when we get the attitude for gratitude right, we actually become more hopeful. We actually become more enthusiastic. We actually become more excited as Christians. You know, as Christians, we should be the most excited people on the planet. I mean, really. And I feel like sometimes as Christians, we may be excited, but the, there's a lot of people that are Christians that their face does not show that. <laughs> you know? And I, and I think we're supposed to be excited. But when we get this attitude of gratitude right, it actually unlocks all these secrets. It unlocks the secrets of optimal living, it un, uh, of optimism, of hope, of encouragement, of generosity. You know, we talked about the offerings this morning, the generosity. God wants us to be a generous Christian. When we get attitude of gratitude for how much he's blessed us with, when we get that part down right, it actually opens us up to be more generous. And, and contentment, all the values, all these things that we're going to talk about in this series, this will be the one that unlocks the next levels for us. This message right here will unlock the next levels when we have an attitude for gratitude. And if I look at negative living, if I look at a negative attitude, if I look at ungrateful living, and that causes, and I know that this causes God to be disappointed in me or disappointed in my life or disappointed in, in, uh, uh, in my ungratefulness, then, then I think that's something that we need to deal with and we need to talk about that. So if you tend to be like on the ungrateful side of things or just not realizing the blessing, and I also don't think, I don't think that we're just ungrateful because we're like, oh, I'm ungrateful for what God has done for me. I just think we don't think about it enough. We just don't think about it enough. You know, but there's a great passage, there's a great passage in scripture that kind of describes this for us, and I want to look at this, and if you have your Bibles, it's in Luke chapter 17, uh, Luke chapter 17, even if you don't have your Bibles, I encourage you to just jot this down somewhere, uh, write this down, because I want you to kind of look at this and pour over this, because there's a lot more to this than what I'm going to be able to unpack today, but Luke chapter 17, it's like verses 11 through 18 or 19, somewhere around in there, and, and this, is, this is coming from Jesus. Before we get to this, and it's going to be on the screen up here too, but before we get to this passage, I want to give you a little bit of background of what's going on, and it'll, it'll help us make this uh, passage make a little bit more sense for us. This passage is dealing with where Jesus is going on his way to Jerusalem, and on his way to Jerusalem, he comes across a leper colony. Now, these men had leprosy, and they lived in a colony by themselves because lepers couldn't live among the people in, because of their condition. Now, leprosy, just so you know, it's not real common today, but uh, leprosy was very, very common 2,000 years ago. Leprosy was a skin condition. Leprosy was this skin condition where your skin, your flesh literally began to rot away from your bones. Imagine what that would look like, especially as the disease progressed. It would be nothing for your, just your whole arm to be oozing pus and and just the nastiest i hate to describe it but i want you to get the full weight of what these people were dealing with these are lepers that are dealing with this like they could go to bed at night and roll over and lose a finger or or or, or worse and again not trying to gross you out but worse have in the conditions that they lived in have a rat come and gnaw on their big toe you know it's just a nasty nasty way to live and they would have to go if you suspected yourself of having leprosy, the way that you were diagnosed with it is that you had to go to the priest, and the priest would declare whether you were clean or unclean ceremonially, whether you could come to worship or whether you didn't have to, go, whether you couldn't come to worship, and whether you had to live in isolation. Aren't you glad 
that if you have a medical diagnosis, you don't have to come to me uh, for me to diagnose you on that, right? But that's what they had to do. They had to go to the priest, and the priest would declare whether or not they could live with society or whether they had to have social isolation. And so that's what, this was the life. It was a death sentence. There was no cure. There was no vaccine. And there were rules and laws, if you had leprosy, for you to social distance. We, we kind of, that's a term we're familiar with right now, right? We, we, we've just come through that anyway. And so they had to social distance. Get this, get this. They had to social distance by staying six feet away from other people. Isn't that kind of ironic, I think? That was the rule. They had to stay six feet away from other people. Now, if the, true, this is absolutely true. Some people thought I was, because I joke around a lot, but this is, this is absolutely true. If the wind was blowing, they had to stay 150 feet away. Uh, that, that's more like the coronavirus, you know, so, uh, isolation in California, right? So, anyway, so they couldn't live in the town. They had to live in leper colonies. They, they couldn't pull their hair back like Cliff did this morning. They had to let their hair come down over their face. Don't know exactly why that is, but probably one of two reasons or both is that it formed sort of a, a maybe so, somewhat of a mask over them, or it at least kept you from seeing the grotesqueness of the skin and flesh rotting off of their face. And they had to cover their upper lip with their hand as they, if they were coming into near contact with anybody else that, was, that did not have leprosy, they had to cover their upper lip like this, and they had to yell out that they were coming, unclean coming, unclean coming, unclean, unclean. Can you imagine the hum humiliation and the embarrassment, the guilt and shame, especially when you were told that it's because of your sin that you have this condition? You know, can you imagine feeling and living that way? Talking about isolation and shame and embarrassment, that's like nothing that we've experienced with COVID. Although I did notice, you know, uh, at the very beginning of this whole pandemic, it was kind of funny, uh, looking back on it now, uh, that like when we went to the grocery store, we were the people that, you know, Michelle brought Lysol, and we had to Lysol our shoes uh, when we got home from the grocery store, and then we had to wash all of our grocery bags. Did anybody else do that? Are we, okay, a couple, couple of you guys drank the Kool-Aid on it like we did, and so, you know, we did that. But I know in the first early, early days of it, you know, I'd go into the store, I wore the mask and everything, and you know, this is the way people were. I had, in the early days, I had a sneeze coming on in Publix, you know. And you just knew that was, you can't cough or sneeze anymore <laughs> during this pandemic. You just can't, you know. And I felt this sneeze coming on. I'm like, and this lady, I swear, this lady just jumped into a pile of sweet corn to get away from me, you know. <laughs> people would just, you want to clear a room out, you cough or sneeze during that, you know, April or May of last year or whatever it was for the month that we were closed down. You know, and so, uh, you know, I mean, it was just crazy, right? But we didn't deal with anything like what they had to deal with. We didn't deal with anything. You're talking about isolation, and this is a death sentence. They are not going to get better. They're going to die like this. And they could have had this for years and years. So I, I wanted you to kind of feel the weight of that. This is what these ten guys that Jesus is going to encounter, that was what their life was like. So now we pick up the scripture. Jesus now... He's on his way to Jerusalem, and he's traveling on the way to Jerusalem. He's traveling along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Now, that's, that's important to, the, to what the history is, is laying out here for us because Samaria is where the Samaritans lived, and they were seen as filthy dogs to the Jews because they intermarried with people that weren't pure Jews, and so the Jews isolated them. In this case... The leper colony was right on the edge, and it was comprised of both Samaritans and of the people from Galilee who were pure, pure Jews. And so Jesus, as he was going into a village, probably the outskirts of a leper colony, as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance, the social distancing part, and they called out in a loud voice. The wind must have been blowing, so they must have been about 150 feet away. They stood at a distance, called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When Jesus saw them, he says, go show yourselves to the priests. Now, if you've read this passage before, you might not have understood or you might have missed what that was. But Jesus knew and the men knew that in order to be 
diagnosed whether or not you were going to be ceremonially, ceremonially clean or unclean, or whether you could go to church or not go to church based on your leprosy, they knew that they would have to go to the priest. And so what Jesus wanted them to do in faith, he wanted them to go to the priest. None of them wanted to go to the priest, not in the condition that they were. That would just be an additional humiliation on their part. But they go to the priest, and they're walking to the priest. And as they're going to the priest, as they went, they were cleansed. As they went, they were cleansed. So imagine this. They're going to the priest, because Jesus tells them to go to the priest, present themselves to the priest. They're walking, and all of a sudden, this affliction that's probably been going on for years and years, and body parts start growing back, and their flesh starts growing back, and they're healed from this nasty, grotesque disease of leprosy. I mean, can you imagine that? This is, if that happened to you, I mean, we would just be like jumping up and down for joy. You know, I'm blind in my right eye. If for some reason I came up to Jesus and he said, hey, go present yourself to the priest and, and I'm walking and all of a sudden my eye, I'm able to see out of this eye again. That's nothing. I didn't dealt with anything like the leprosy people. But if I got the vision back in this eye, I'd be like, I'd be jumping up and down for joy, gratefulness and thankful. I mean, like, like these people, the conditions that they lived in, I just want you to feel the weight of that. And then it goes on into verse 15. It says, one of them, one of them, when he saw he was healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. I mean, I, I don't know what it would have been like for you or me even being in a condition like that. But if that happened, I believe I would just come back and just fall right at Jesus' feet and just thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I just don't even know how to thank you. This thank you is not even enough. What can I do? This is thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, and so this man falls at Jesus' feet, and this is where Jesus is kind of, even Jesus, the God of the universe, kind of scratching his head here. He's going, wait a minute, didn't I send 10 of you? Weren't there 10 of you that were healed? Weren't there 10 of you that were cleansed? Where's the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God <laughs> except this foreigner? I like what it says. I missed this part. It says, he, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. So the un, most unlikely person, the most unlikely person to come back was the Samaritan, who didn't think that Jews would have anything to do with them at all. And Jesus is scratching his head. He's going, that's only 10%? One out of 10 of you were grateful that I healed them? That's insane. I, did, I just don't get, I mean, that's kind of one I picture God. I know God knows all, but that's one of the ones I kind of picture Jesus going, I don't get it. I don't get it. How can you be so ungrateful? Then he looks at the one. This is not on the screen. This is in verse 19. He looks at the one and he says, now I want you to rise up. Rise up because your faith has made you well. Now he healed. He healed all 10 of them physically. But there was only one that was healed spiritually, apparently. So you, you, can be, you can be physically okay, but spiritually not okay. And so Jesus, he, he says, but th th this man, this man, you're well now. And his faith had made him well. And Jesus said, because this man had faith in Jesus, because this man was grateful, because this man had put his trust and hope and faith in Jesus, he's not just, not just physically well, but he's spiritually well. So when I look in this passage of Scripture, one of the things that I see is that in order for us to have a greater spiritual disposition, we need to have a heart of gratitude. We need to have an attitude of gratitude. And that attitude of gratitude leads to us living positive lives. There's nothing shallow about that. There's nothing shallow about that. That might be the richest, deepest things that we need to hear in our culture. All right, I want to give you, what I want to do is, so, so uh, I think that's a great, great example from Luke that Jesus lays out for us about gratefulness in our heart, to be grateful for the blessings and what God has done for us. But I want to help us just practically here for a second. I want to give three statements uh, that will help you to choose uh, gratitude in our lives. And the first one is that, I, that we need to come to the, making this statement on our own. I know that every good thing I have comes from God. 
that I know that every good gift, every good thing that I have comes from God. James even says it. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Now, some of you, I, I've seen this. Some of you in the, in the time that I've been here, you know, I've gotten to be able to rub shoulders with you and kind of have a window into your life. And I know some of, some of you have, are going through some major, major challenges. I mean, major challenges, heartbreaking challenges of what you've gone through. And yet you're living this out. You're, you're living this message out that even in spite of your circumstances, even in spite of what's going on, you are saying, hey, but these are all great gifts. I'm alive. I'm alive. That right there is a gift from God, you know, and you're able to say every good, every good thing I have comes from God. The second thing, and I want to dive into this just a little bit more, is that I will not let what I want rob me of the joy and what I already have. I will not let what I don't have keep me from appreciating what I do have. You know, it's another way of saying it. But I will not let what I want rob me of what I, I have. And this is a problem. I think this is probably the, one of the biggest challenges for us as, uh, in our culture as Americans. I think it really is probably because I think a lot of us, maybe not you, maybe you're an exception to the rule, but I think a lot of us live with this mentality of we want more, we want more, we want more, we want more, we want more. We want more. We want more. You know, I've shared this with you about one of my greatest all-time, and you'll hear this, you'll probably get tired of hearing about George Fugit, but I tell this story about George Fugit when I was a youth pastor in 1990. I was a youth pastor. George Fugit was 101 years old, and he was one of my youth sponsors. And, uh, and he would come and tell stories of World War I and World War II. One day I asked him the question, I said, George, what's the number one problem with America today? What's the number one problem? He didn't hesitate. He didn't take a breath. And he goes, greed. Greed is the number one problem. We're always wanting more. We're always wanting more. We're always wanting more. Hey, listen, I don't want to be a hypocrite up here because sometimes I wrestle with this. Sometimes I deal with this. I was already thinking about this this week, and I'm going, okay, I'm going to have to confess this because I've done this already. You guys already know. I've already been talking about, what do I want? A a Jeep. You You bought me a remote control Jeep. You already know. And even this week, I'm going, I'm getting in and out of my little, why am I driving this little car? I've never had a little car before in my life. I'm a truck guy. I'm a Jeep guy. I'm not a little car guy. And I've just been complaining and griping about it. I almost said something else. And and, uh, and I've been griping and complaining about this thing, grumbling about it. Even this week, I'm getting out. I can't even get out of this little thing. You know what? I know I need to lose some weight. I'll get out of it a little easier. But, you know, and then I'm sitting there going, wait a minute. How can I stand up before the church and talk about gratitude? This car runs. It gets me where I need to go, you know? Still want the Jeep. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, why am I grumbling? But that's just kind of that's kind of the way our culture is and the way we're kind of wired up, you know? And so we, we say things. I want a better car. I want a bigger house. I want a pool. I want granite countertops. I want a better job. I want a better kid. You know, whatever it is, you know? And so, uh, did you guys catch that? <laughs> you know, so... So Solomon says, so Solomon says, better what the eye sees. I like this. Better what the eyes sees than the roving of the appetite. In other words, better what you have in front of you right here, better what you see than this perpetual desire for this thing over here that you don't have. And be happy. This is the way, this is my way of saying it. Be happy with the grass on your side of the fence. Be happy with the grass on your side of the fence. And I love what the Apostle Paul says in this. Man, he speaks to this. And if anybody if anybody can teach this, he can teach this. I can't teach this. I've grown up with so much, you guys. But this, the Apostle Paul can teach this. He goes, for I've learned, he goes, I've learned to be content. Now, I like this, that he uses the word learned. This doesn't, for us, this doesn't just come naturally. Don't beat yourself up if you're feeling like, man, I I feel terrible. I'm, I haven't been really grateful. You know what? It's something that we have to learn. This is, it doesn't come natural. The natural tendency is selfishness, right? The natural tendency is mine, 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 just like when we were little kids. But Paul's saying, this is something I've learned. And it, it's taken a long time to learn this, that I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances are. I wasn't always that way, but I've had to learn it. 
He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. There was a time even before this, there was a time when the Apostle Paul was like, he was the guy. He was the Pharisee. He was the wealthy. He was the wealthy one. He goes, I know what it's like to be in need, and I know what it has to be to have plenty. I've learned the secret. I know what the unlock, I know how to unlock the code here. I know how to go to the next level. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every circumstances. And if you think about Paul's contentment here, you know, if anybody can say this, we can listen to him. He's been through, you know, here he is traveling for God, speaking for God, starting churches, and he's been in shipwrecks. He's been in prison for his faith. He's been uh, stripped naked and beaten, tarred and feathered. He's been bitten by a snake. He, he had some kind of thorn in his side or thorn in his flesh. And we don't know what that was. Probably some physical ailment. He could heal other people, but he couldn't heal himself. God didn't heal him. We don't know why. But all these things. And he says, I've learned to be content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or whether hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. I came across, I came across this statement this week, and man, it just kind of, oh, I had to read it twice and then three times, and then I thought, I got to say this. Um, I don't know who said it. I don't, I, I, don't quote me on it, but you can quote this on your Facebook page because this is good stuff right here. It's not happy people. It's not happy people that are grateful. It's grateful people that are happy. I, when that, man, when I heard that, I thought, jeez, that's so true. It, 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 it's not happy people that are grateful. It's grateful people that are happy. And if we get this down, man, it, uh, it, can, really, it can really help us in our spiritual formation in our lives. What, what I want to do, I want to just kind of share this with you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to seem like, where's he going with this all of a sudden, you know? But I want to share this with you because this is one of the, uh, this is kind of a message within a message. But uh, if you just hang with me, it's going to come back around, and you'll kind of see what I'm, what I'm doing here. I have been involved in mission work, global mission work, international mission work, for, for about 31 years, actually, ever since I've been in ministry. And it's been fantastic. From 1990 to 2005, I started churches and planted churches, built churches, worked with, did medical missions trips, and did all this kind of stuff in, in Jamaica. Did most of my work in Jamaica at the time. Now, I'm not talking about you guys that have gone on your cruise ships to you know, Ocho Rios or Montego Bay. No, I'm not talking about that. I was up in the mountains, in the very mountainous region, Mandeville, Jamaica, primarily, and a lot of the different towns. I'm part Jamaican. You just got, you just know it, you know. Like, I can, I can speak Patois, you know. Me carry me aki, go Linstead Market, not a Kwaki will sell. You didn't understand a word I said there, you know. And uh, what's a Guaman, you know. And, you know. So, like, I've, I've lived Jamaica. I feel part Jamaican. Part, part of my heart is in Jamaica. I love, love, love Jamaica. And so I would take trips and lead trips there. I was the only white person. In 1990, I was about the only white person up in the mountains. And when I came through, man, people would just, like, stare at me, you know. They would come up and want to rub their hands through my hair. And that's how long ago that it was, you know. <laughs> and, uh, it, and that's really, that's the truth. It was really fantastic. I love, 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 love Jamaicans and the Jamaican culture and, and done so much there. But one of the things that I saw there is uh, I took a group of teens back in 1990 or so. I took a group of teens from Lexington, Kentucky. Now, Lexington, Kentucky, I've got my Kentucky friend over here, uh, Sue. Uh, I took a group of, of teens from Lexington. Now, Lexington is a very, very wealthy, wealthy area. And sometimes people think about Kentucky, they don't realize this, but Kentucky, Lexington area is one of the wealthiest places in America. It's crazy. Some of the horse barns, they have chandeliers in them that are nicer than most houses. I mean, they are just, it's really almost sinful it's just like really crazy how expensive the houses are There's mansions next to mansions next to mansions it's just crazy in, in parts of lexington and i took a lot of these kinds of teens that grew up that way that had everything given to them on a silver platter i took them and we were going to build a church in jamaica and and uh, we were sleeping on dirt floors we were eating out you know spam out of cans and and uh, we weren't able to get fresh vegetables and those things but but there were lots of fresh vegetables there we had no way to keep them and these kids see the living conditions of the people that we, where we were at. They saw the, kind of the destitution. And they saw, but then they saw how happy they were, too. They were just saw there was this joy that's hard to understand and hard to comprehend if you've never been like this, you know. And these conditions where, you know, one of the guys that was working with us, the only thing he had in his life was he had a concrete uh, block wall and a tin roof, and he owned a goat, you know, and that was it. And, and he was the most happy, joyful, 
you know, person on the planet, and, and our kids would see this, and they would think, wait a minute, you don't, you don't have anything, and yet you're so happy. And then I remember one time there was this elderly lady that lived down the street. She didn't even go to the church, but she didn't want us to not have refrigeration at the church. And so she donated her refrigerator out of her house, out of her house. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine a youth group coming here to do some work or something? And you thought, hey, I want the youth group. And you don't even go to this church. And you thought, I want the youth group to have, be able to have refrigeration, to be able to refrigerate their food and the vegetables and things. And so she paid a couple guys out of her pocket, poor, poor people. I mean, you know, financially poor, poor people. And these two guys carried this refrigerator, and they're carrying it down the street. And I remember our kids, very affluent kids, looking down the road, and they're seeing this refrigerator coming, and they bring it up. And they said, we wanted to donate this refrigerator to you for the two weeks that you're going to be here building this church. And you could just see these kids just melted, and they began to cry. And, and it was just one of the most fascinating things to see. They weren't crying because of, they were crying because of what they didn't have. They were crying because of what they didn't have. They didn't have the kind of joy that they were seeing in the generosity and the appreciation and the gratitude of those who were giving to us. It was absolutely fantastically amazing. So what I would say on this is I love mission work, and, I, and, and my mission work has changed over the years as a, as a result of that. I've done work Now I've done work in, in Central America and Africa, Dominican Republic, planted churches there, and now we're doing work in Guatemala. I'm really excited about uh, that. We've kind of been on pause, you know, with COVID and stuff. But I've had people ask the question, I've had people ask the question, why do, we, why do we go help poor kids in other countries when we have kids in our own community that need help? Why do we do that? That's a fair question to ask. It's actually a very honest and it's a very fair question to ask. But here's how I would respond to that. The way I respond to it is that, first of all, if you've asked that question, chances are you probably haven't been because you, you haven't seen that there's this reciprocity that happens. There's a great reciprocity that happens in, in, in global work where when we go, when we go as Americans, a lot of times in, in mission work in the past, we would go and we would throw our money to this thing or we'd, and we'd do some good thing and we pat ourselves on the back. Oh, look at us. Look at how good we are. And then we feel good about it. We come back home. When the reality is when we go, we actually receive way more than what we bring to the table. Are you following me? Are you tracking this? So when us as Americans, when we go on international trips to developing countries, okay, to developing countries, we bring about three things, three primary things to the table. What we bring, we bring resources, we bring money. We, nobody that lives in a country like America, that's an evangelical country, nobody has more money than we do that we contribute to mission work. So we bring money. We bring education. We bring Christian education to the churches and to the people. Nobody, nobody else in the world does the education piece in the Christian uh, education world than the United States of America. Nobody. We, we are hands down the best at that. And then nobody brings, again, nobody in the evangelical world. There's other countries that do a good job, but nobody in the evangelical world brings technology. So those are the three things that we bring to the table. We bring money, we bring education, and we bring technology. But what we also, what we need to realize is that when we go, we actually learn something. We gain something with a global partnership with them that's far greater than anything that we can bring to them financially. And so what we learn, what they bring to the table for us in developing countries, they bring this resourcefulness. They figured out how to do more to be the church, to be the local church. They figured out how to love people more that with less resources than we have. They figured out how to be the church. In America, we tend to just pay for everything that we want, even as a church body. You know, we tend to just say, well, let's just hire somebody to do that, or let's just pay somebody to do that. They figured out how to do, the, to do ministry without a lot. And the, and the other thing that they bring is youthfulness. Most developing countries are way, way younger than the United States. They're way younger than the United States. So they bring this energy to the table. So we learn from them. We learn resourcefulness, which is going to be really important for us in the future. We learn resource. But here's the third thing. And this is what I wanted. I spent a long time to get here. But this is the third thing that I want us to know is that they bring a joy that we just don't experience. They, they bring a joy that if you've not been before like that, you just can't comprehend it. There is this, and it, begin, it comes out of, it's born out of gratefulness. They have a grateful heart. And they don't 
allow what they don't have to rob them of the joy that they have in what Jesus has done for them. Does that, does that all kind of make sense? And it's so important for us. That's why global partnerships, I think, is so important. But I just wanted you to see that this is a challenge for us. This whole gratefulness thing is a challenge for us. And we can learn how to do that. We can learn how to be that better by partnering with people who, who they've figured that piece out of how to be content, like Paul said, in all situations. When you ask, when you ask uh, and they did, they did a poll for Americans, they said, um, what does it take to be happy or to be joyful? If you have 30, they ask a person that makes $30,000 a year, they say, what does it take to be happy or joyful, to feel like you're rich, to feel like you've got it, you, you're, you're there? And the person that made $30,000 a year said it takes $60,000 a year. The, they ask a person that made $50,000 a year, what does it take? They said it takes $100,000 a year. They asked the person that made $100,000 a year, what does it take to be happy, to feel like you've got enough to make $200,000 a year? They asked the person that made $500,000 a year, you see where this is going, you know, how much to be happy? They said $1 million a year. Then they asked the person that makes $1 million a year, what does it take to be happy? What you, you know what they said? $5 million a year. Isn't that crazy? So it seems as if, it seems as if the more that we have, the more that we want, and there's nothing wrong, listen, there's nothing wrong with bettering our situation. There's nothing wrong with working hard. There's nothing wrong with making financial, good financial decisions. It's just that when the desire for those things surpasses the gratefulness that we have in our heart for what we already have, it can lead to negativity. It can lead to grumbling. It can lead to discontentment. Is that... Is that is that weighty? Is that like, do you guys get that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Okay. All right. Man. So, so that's a big piece. That's a big piece to this. And if we can get this piece down, if we can get this piece down, man, we're going to be further along and we're going to live with this contentment in our hearts. We're going to live with this gratefulness in our hearts that when people outside these walls, that are living these negative lives, that are not happy, that they're not happy with where they're at, they're going to look at us and they're going to see, these people aren't just going to church for some religious ceremony. They're living this thing out. They get it. They're joyful and they're happy. What's the cause of that? And then when you're living that way, then you get to share Christ. You're not knocking on their doors. Have you heard about Jesus? No. They're seeing Jesus in the way that you live. All right, that's enough. Third thing. Uh, the third thing is, I'm just going to run through this real quick. I'll turn every blessing that I have into praise. I'll turn every blessing I have into praise. Uh, somebody else said this, somebody smarter than me, but I, I took this quote, that whenever we don't turn a blessing that we have back into praise, it actually turns into pride. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Whenever we don't turn a blessing back into praise, it turns into pride. So if we're kind of going, hey, I deserve this. I earned this. That's why I deserve this. Then it kind of becomes prideful. So we, we need to turn every blessing that we have and turn it back into praise. A couple scriptures, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, I'll praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I'll be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Another uh, passage in Psalms 103 says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. Think about your blessings that you've had. Write down your blessings. Write them down. Count them one by one. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things He does for me. I don't know how we just, it's so easy for us to forget. I think it's a good exercise. Write them down. Write them down. Count your blessings one by one. He forgives all my sins and heals all my disease. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercy. He fills my life with good things. Man, we start living that way. We start living with an attitude of gratitude. I'm telling you what, it will change the world. It will change the world. All right, let's pray. Are you stand with me? Father, I, I uh, feel like a hypocrite right now because um, I don't always live by the words that I was speaking today. But that is my desire. It is my desire to 
live with a grateful heart. And so I pray that as Paul said, I've learned this. I pray that you will keep revealing yourself to us and keep teaching us this and help us to just realize that sometimes we're not grateful. And I wonder if those nine guys with leprosy, they, <laughs> I don't know how in the world they could have not been grateful for that, but maybe they just, I don't know. I can't even figure that out. And I think even Jesus scratched his head. Lord, I think you even scratched your head on that. But I pray, God, that we would be a grateful people embracing the blessings that you have given us. And if you don't do another thing on this planet for us from here on out, what you've done for us through Jesus is more than enough. In Jesus' name, amen. I search the world, but it could fill me. Man's empty praise, the treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along, and you put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Yes. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, you've seen them all. Still, you call me friend, yes, Lord. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Yes, we'll sing it out. Oh.
We'll see you next week. God bless you guys.